don't ever do sketches, don't do designs, don't do anything for free because the chances of you getting hired are fairly limited and you're giving away the most valuable part of your um, services. Business of Architecture, episode 413. Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture. I'm your host, Ryan Willard, and this week I'm speaking to Jared Della Valla who has been a real estate professional and architect for more than 18 years and has managed the acquisition and pre-development of more than 1 million square foot in New York City, specifically in Brooklyn, along the High Line, in the Hudson Yards, Dumbo, and in Brooklyn. He is a member of the US Green Building Council and he's previously taught at Columbia University, Syracuse, Washington, and Parsons. Um, this lecture, conversation, discussion I had with Jared was absolutely fascinating. And he's really, with his company Alloy, um, they are really treading that desired line of career path that so many architects wish to be engaged in, which is being architect developer. And some of the work that Alloy are doing are, is incredible. Obviously, one of the most fiercest and most competitive real estate uh, environments on the planet in New York City, in particular in, in Brooklyn. And the work that they are doing there is architect, design-led and, and driven, and is a very fascinating model for many other architects to be looking at. So sit back, relax, and enjoy Jared Della Valla. This podcast is produced by Business of Architecture, a leading business consultancy for architects and design professionals. This episode is sponsored by Smart Practice, Business of Architecture's flagship program to help you structure your firm for freedom, fulfillment and financial profit. If you want access for our free training on how to do this, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you want to speak directly to one of our advisors about how he might be able to help you, please follow the link in the information. Jared, welcome to the business of architecture. How are you? Yeah, I'm doing great. Brilliant. Well, superb to meet you and to have you on the show. You are the CEO and founder of Alloy Development. You're based in New York. You've got your... In Brooklyn. Kind of, in Brooklyn. In Brooklyn. Apologies. Brooklyn. Apologies. In Brooklyn. You're in Brooklyn. <laughs> and... And you occupy this really fascinating territory of architecture and development, and you're perhaps doing what many architects have as their number one aspiration in their careers, is to occupy the seat as a developer, and, and you're, you're doing it no less in one of the most fiercest uh, real estate markets anywhere on the planet. Um, so I, I guess the first question is, how did this begin? How did you start making your way into the exciting world of real estate um, from an architectural perspective? How did, the, how did the business evolve into the model that we see yeah. today? Well, it, it's, it's, been a, it's been quite a journey. Um, it actually started in graduate school for me, um, which was with a, a recognition that it's great to do all of these studio projects, but in the end, somebody was going to make a decision about whether or not you would get to build that. So you could be the most talented architect in the room, but ultimately I realized you had to have a client say yes and commit the funding um, to do so. And so I wrote um, a paper, um, which is a, a business plan. I had a business school class. I did a dual masters in both architecture and construction management, and I was required to take a business school class. And in that class, um, I wrote a paper or a thesis on being an architect uh, developer contractor and uh, it was a very early recognition and um, when I graduated from school I moved to New York City and I worked for a construction company uh, for a handful of years and had a kind of shotgun wedding approach to starting an architecture practice through winning a design competition for uh, the federal government here to build a plaza in San Francisco. and. Um, we got this commission and I was in my 20s and we started a firm and all of that was great, but I couldn't figure out how to get work. I moved to New York City and while I'm in New York City, I grew up um, in New York, not New York City proper. I didn't, having gone to school in the Midwest, I didn't really have a network of friends and family that were wealthy that, you know, were going to hire architects to mm. do just about anything. And so I reflected back on my business school uh, class and I decided, well, you know, 
screw it, I'm just going to go and start putting offers on buildings and I'm going to try to buy a building. Um, and um, I thought back to that business plan and I figured, well, no one's going to question that I'm going to be the architect if I bring them the deal. And um, that really turned out to be true. And it took me a really long time, candidly, to start real estate. There wasn't anybody in the industry who was doing it that I could mm -hmm. really look at. Um, you know, it was John Portman, has to call it historically, um, who was really a promoter uh, who, who participated in hotel development um, in, in Georgia. But actually buying buildings, taking significant risk, et cetera, was something that I had to learn. And being in my mid-20s, I hired this like gray-haired broker. Um, it was pre-internet to approach building owners and say, I have a client who wants to buy your building. And I would look through public records and try to figure out what I would offer. If I was successful in getting to a negotiated price, I would then get the contract, send it to a friend of mine who was a lawyer, and just told him to sit on it. And then I would write a business plan as fast as I possibly could. And then I would go around looking for capital um, using any resource I could. And you know, for the first bunch of years, I was using the wrong language. I had no idea what I was doing. I had to teach myself Excel and how to write, do underwriting. And you know, over time, and it literally, I'd, without exaggeration, it took me about seven years to get me my first deal. But I, I worked, call it a second job, every night for the architecture firm trying to build this development practice and mm -hmm. trying to teach myself real estate. There really wasn't a real estate school at the time, right? Most real estate developers went got an MBA or something like that, and architecture school didn't have any business classes, so I was kind of off in the wilderness, wandering around. And, um, you know, finally I succeeded in convincing the city of New York, actually, through a public RFP um, for an affordable housing project in East New York to um, develop some affordable housing. And the proposition was, you know, architects as developers um, in, um, a program called New Foundations, and you know, I really credit New York City with giving me the chance because it was the type of project where local builders were picking up vacant lots, essentially, and they would Xerox a set of plans, submit it as part of their RFP, say I could build this single, you know, uh, single lot and build two or three families on it, and it was a way to get tax revenue back on New York City's books and at the same time create work for a local population. But we, we approached it slightly differently with a different kind of proposition, which was affordable housing is the single most important um, thing that we can be doing. Yeah. And architects who are accustomed to doing design competition, we could treat it like a design competition. And essentially, I brought together four different firms and we submitted plans for eight different lots. and. It, it was intended to be a little bit more provocative and less risky for the city. And so we ended up buying eight lots for about a thousand bucks and built affordable housing, which was a, effectively a no risk proposition because we knew they would absorb into the marketplace and we knew we'd get to experiment. And candidly, the city and HPD specifically wanted us to experiment a little bit. And so um, we were able to question a lot of the fundamental rules of affordable housing and, and put as much thought into it as possible. And so that, you know, there were like 3,000 applications for eight houses. You know? Wow. So, so that first deal was relatively, it wasn't that capital intensive for you guys? or No, I mean, it was interesting. We, um, we contributed our architecture fee and we invested our architecture fee. And, um, and I was the developer and I was able to invest fees, which is interesting, right? Because architecture fees are as good as equity. The developer usually needs to spend through and get to construction documentation um, and finish that, which is about 80% of the fee for a traditional architect. And so we invested that money um, and that was my capital and the rest was subsidy um, you know, from the city um, in putting together the total construction cost and everything else. And it wasn't that capital intensive um, but we were also willing to take a big risk on it. We invested literally 80 cents on the dollar of all of our, our fees, and we used our other income-producing work mm. to be able to afford to do that. Because this is another interesting part about, you know, for an architect to be able to step into development, often the first hurdle is, well, where do you get the capital from? And the second thing is, like what you're explaining here, is that once you've got the project, involved it's going to be a little while before you see any returns on it so how do you cash flow it whilst you're doing the project 
Yeah, it's it's really um, a great question. I mean, fundamentally, right? As a as a developer, um, we take risk. Yeah, and um, that means forgiving or foregoing short term um, certainty for long term appreciation. Right. That, that, that's the that's the business model. Short term pain for long term gain. The kind of <laughs> exactly, exactly, and and you know, I don't know whether it's because you know I'm missing some possible brain function or <laughs> something else, but um, we've become accustomed to a lot of risk and evaluating that risk and and taking risk in order to achieve you know great architecture and you know we uh, we're very focused on. Uh, risk mitigation, and candidly, the majority of our business model is about risk mitigation and control, right? We're architect, we're the developer, we are the real estate broker, we are sometimes the contractor, we are the management company, we do all the branding and collateral and information for ourselves, and I mean, that's not a mystery, that's, that's A, we have a control issue, <laughs> um, but, but uh, largely we have a control issue because there's also always a value set affiliated with the work that we're doing, but also it's actual financial risk mitigation, which is a lot has to go wrong to at least not make back our fees on all of those things. And we charge our projects those fees. And so it gives us a markedly different cushion than the rest of the market mm -hmm. has, because all we have to do is get paid and break even. And even if we don't make money on the project, we've at least covered our overhead, right? In the way that a traditional architecture practice would work, which is say, hey, I got my fees. And even if I'm getting them a little bit late, um, which is not always the case because uh, we've shifted our business model a little bit these days, but um, it's, uh, it would have to, a lot more would have to go wrong for us to lose money technically. How, so do you have the company set up as two companies? One is the development arm and one is the design arm and then the development arm pays the design arm or is it all... Yeah, <laughs> I, I wish we could show a visual because it's 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 it is really five companies. Right. Um, everybody is an employee of the development company, um, and the principals are principals of different companies based on their licensure. So the design company, my partner AJ and I are um, the only owners of a design company, and that's because only licensed architects can be owners of. Um, of a design company, the real estate brokerage company I am the sole principal of. I'm a licensed real estate broker. I'm the only one in the office. And so I own that. And, and the construction company and the management company, along with Alloy Development Holdings, are all owned together. But we refer to everything collectively as Alloy because it really functions as a single business. And it has a handful of limbs or technical aspects to the corporate structure for both insurance purposes, liability, and let's call it, you know, um, compliance that are required, but we made it all up. Like it was literally a very organic, not a very deliberate path. It 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 wound its way a, a whole slew of different directions over time in order to candidly be compliant and to make the right presentation to our lenders, partners, financial institutions, or otherwise that wanted to see things built in a call it traditional way, mm. and they didn't understand like how we were doing it. But I mean. To a degree, we've eviscerated the traditional platform of architecture and the checks and balances and the systems of, call it the owner-architect-contractor triangle, because a lot of times I'm all three parties, yeah. and I, I actually have to sign paperwork for my lender that's signed by, the same piece of paper will sign by me as owner, me as architect, and me as contractor, <laughs> but then it gets processed by the bank like it's everything else, and it's just the way that, you know some robot is looking at this document being like, yep, they signed AIA form, blah, blah, blah. That, that means we pay them, <laughs> right? And, and so we've just gone about it. You know, whatever means necessary is the way we kind of talk about so it. So after that first project that you, that you kind of got your feet wet, if you like, with the development, how did it then influence the, the development of the company? Was it, was it kind of like, this was a success, this is, we, we want to do more of this? Or, and what, what were some of the lessons learned? Yeah, great, great set of questions. I mean, um, when I did the first project in East New York, that was um, really the architecture firm seeking development work as a way to make work for the architecture company. And then over time, the development company started to um, get, you know, acquire larger things with bigger aspirations and, and more risk affiliated with them. And for a while, 
I really had Della Valley Bernheimer Design with my partner Andy Bernheimer and Alloy Development happening with my partner Catherine and AJ. And I lived in these two worlds of having two companies running kind of simultaneously. And what I realized on the architecture side was that I couldn't provide service to my clients on the architecture side and be a principal in the development company. It just didn't work. It was not great for my partner Andy at the time. And, and um, it was a disservice because architecture at the end of the day is a client service business and, and, and clients need good service. And because I was at risk, my focus was elsewhere, right? right. I had to manage my own risk. And while those projects happened to be architecture projects for the firm and we made good work with them and I'm very proud of all of that. Ultimately, I decided through Alloy over time that I couldn't provide services to anybody else. Right. And so Alloy is very insular, which is we don't do development for other people who own land. We don't, we don't do architecture service for other people who um, are seeking our design capacity and we don't do real estate brokerage for people who would like us to help them uh, sell. And, and like I said before, it's been just kind of a very organic, and you know, it's taken, I guess Alloy is now 16 years old, but I've been doing development for 22, 23 years, and I've learned a lot over that period. Well, that, well that, that's very interesting how, you, how you've set the, you know, you, it's, it's, it's become quite insular, and that you guys solely work with, your, with yourselves. And you can imagine, and I've, I've heard, and many other architects who have been involved or wanted to be involved in development that well a big chunk of their clients are developers and now as soon as they're yes. stepping into the world of development they're now getting into competition with their existing client base which has got all <laughs> sorts of conflicts involved in it so but that's how i got work early on which is the developers wanted to hire us because they knew i knew what it was like to be in their shoes i had their perspective yeah. um but they're also very demanding, right? Developers are demanding, and, and so that made it very difficult. Um, but yeah, I mean, I'd say that we achieved the freedom to do one project at a time, which is how our business works. Mm -hmm. I can't really do two. I can do, you know, our, our corporate tree is actually circular because we operate on a time scale and we're, you know, we start a project and I can do acquisition and pre-development and getting a project to entitlement. I can only do one of those at a time. And then once I'm in construction with something, I could start technically another project. So over the last 16 years or whatever, we've literally only acquired 12 or 13 different assets. And it shows you how deliberate that is. Now, over time, those acquisitions are now getting bigger yeah. because we have more capacity, um, both financially and technically to do the work. Um, that we'd like to do. And we're also realizing that if we're only going to do one every three years, that like most projects take three to four years, some of our projects now are taking 10, but that it needs to have enough economic output to make it worth not having any, call it big returns annually, right? So it needs to, it needs to make a certain amount of money. Got it. So, so these, this sort of portfolio that you've been developing, how, how did you go about kind of accruing these assets? Was it a question of you were looking for the land first or these things kind of happened kind of by chance? Yeah, it, it's well, it's catch as catch can completely, <laughs> right? I was talking to someone yesterday about it, about our call it future business plan. And I was like, I'd love to say that we had some really deliberate approach, but the truth is you only know when you can buy something, A, when you're willing to pay the most, and B, when you trust your instinct enough to say, this is worth it for me to take mm. a risk on. And you don't know what that context is going to be. It's not like, you usually can't just pick a piece of land and say, I want to buy that. Because um, New York, yeah. in New York in particular, the best real estate is usually not for sale. And so amongst the things that are for sale, you have to, you have to make those choices. That being said, we have been very deliberate and we do curate very highly what it is that we're looking for. And our advantage in the marketplace is to use the skill set of the architect and our ability to like see something the development community mm. can't, right? We, the longer an asset's been on the market, the more complicated it is, the more likely it is that we are to succeed. Um, because we don't have to ask, you know, another firm to do studies for us, we will just do that. We will spend as much time as it takes to buy something um, and to figure it out. And oftentimes that means it's just sheer effort because it doesn't cost us anything. 
I can put my entirety of my staff on an acquisition for a handful of weeks and press pause on everything else that I have going on to try to buy something if I feel like that's the right thing to do. And that gives us a huge wow, advantage yeah. in the marketplace. So, so what have become the kind of niche sites, if you like, or the ones that you love to get your hands on or the ones that you know, present problems for other developers, but is there, a, is there a kind of formula that's beginning, that you're beginning to recognize in these, that's kind of sharpening yeah. that intuition or sharpening that, you know, intuitive sense for this is going to be a, this, will, this would work for us. We're usually operating best in new neighborhoods or neighborhoods that don't have an identity yet. So, you know, East New York, then we moved to the High Line before it was the High Line, and then Hudson Yards before it was the Hudson Yards, and then Brooklyn before Brooklyn had its moment. And so I, I don't know whether it's intuition or otherwise, but we have a real history of finding where the next place is going mm -hmm. to be um, and investing our time there. And then amongst you know, those assets, you can start really focusing. We actually built a piece of software um, to help us track, it's like a news feed almost that we created that's map based where we can tag individual parcels with information that's anecdotal where, you know, the principals or all of our employees can say, oh, I met with this landowner over here in 2022 and he wanted $28 million for his land. And, you know, it, we, we have all these great stories, but it it helps us actually start to see visually where we find interest over right. time. And you can actually see on the map, like, oh my God, we've looked at 28 properties within a three block radius. There's something about this place. And then you start embedding, you know, our market knowledge of that place. And over time you get to know people. And I think the quality of our work has also and um, made it such that landowners intuitively trust mm -hmm. us, um, which is, we start very casual and informal conversations and we usually buy where we know. And I joked before when we started the podcast about being a Brooklyn developer, and I mean that, which is I won't develop on the other side of the river now. Um, our last five projects have been within a block of our office and I, I live across the street, Ooh. right? And that market knowledge and knowing all of the neighbors in Dumbo, as an example, meant that anytime something comes up for sale in Dumbo, it comes to us usually first. And even if it, it comes to us first and then they decide to run a market process. If we want it, we can usually still afford to buy it slash beat the rest of the market because we've spent more time on it or we know it. And our last handful of acquisitions were exactly that way um, until we got into doing, call it significantly larger work like we're doing now in downtown Brooklyn. But in Dumbo specifically, the last decade is complete intimacy of you know, knowledge, information, relationships and, and participating mm -hmm. in a community that my business partners and I live in. So. And and um, typically the project developments you're doing, are they built to sell or they're built, you're building them to rent and you're holding on to the assets and kind of just using the, using the cash yeah. flow? Well, uh, the early part of our career, which I define as the first 15 years we had to do build right. for sale work. Um, we had to prove the business model. We had to have projects that were faster, that could recognize uh, returns um, for uh, the investors and for our lenders and pay everybody off and build a real track record of uh, both design performance and economic performance um, over our portfolio in order to be able to afford to do rentals. And rentals is, um, you know, something that we've been aspiring mm -hmm. to. Um, we have a pipeline uh, with our Flatbush project of about 900 units that'll come online over the next seven years. And, you know, one of the challenges with building condominiums is that you build them and you sell them. And while you might be left with some money in your bank account, you've detached from the thing that you made and loved, right? <laughs> For so long that you toiled over. And my partners and I fortunately live in, we have the privilege of living in the buildings that we yeah. develop. So we often have a relationship with the buildings that we um, live in. And, and again, they're in the neighborhood and where I live, but that detachment is, um, problematic in a handful of ways. One, there's just a lot of long-term liability in developing for sale condominiums. Um, the statistic in New York is one lawsuit for every two apartments <laughs> you've built. So it's pretty shocking wow. and scary. Fortunately, that's, that's not happened to yeah. us yet. Um, but we do have a goal to own the assets. And I think a lot of that is about, A, wanting to really care for the thing that we made and loved. And 
to really trying to build a culture in those places and a value set that is affiliated with our brand value set, right? And well, the development gig, call it, started as a way to both have agency over the process and to call it um, earn the economic reward that architects have been stripped of, you know, all of yeah. these years. It's really become today much more about this alternative value set of, you know, for us, we have a clear mission, which is to make Brooklyn beautiful, equitable, and sustainable. And so this value add and how to leverage our work into creating public benefit has become like what we care about most right now. Um, because as my business partners say, we, we don't make cupcakes, right? Like we can't throw them out if they're not a good batch. So we have to make great pieces of our city that are memorable. Um, and we're willing to do whatever it takes to, to get there. And sometimes that's just sheer endurance and sometimes that's economic strength. But, you know, mostly it's about spending enough time with something to really mature it into um, a, an integral piece of the city that for us is um, really critical to our success going forward, or at least how we'll measure our success. With each new, as you were saying, you kind of do each project one by one and there's a kind of a nice sequence to it is it very much then the case that the once you've sold the project that you've been working on that's the thing that releases the equity the the money to be able to invest back into the next project or or are you using ex a lot of external finance and other structures as well or? Yeah, it's it's definitely some sum and some which is we of course always look forward to those moments of the ends of projects where we have new capital to mm -hmm. invest. But largely that's not, it, there's not been a relationship between the end of a project and the start right. of a new one. It's really been about the bandwidth of our team. And what we found is um, because of our track record, um, we've been able to raise capital um, at an unimaginable scale to a degree. I mean, our first phase of Flatbush right now, um, we, you know, put together about $450 million in financing between New York City sources, traditional lending sources, uh, institutional capital, and uh, our own capital and, and a group of private investors. And historically, our projects were small enough where it could be just us and a single mm -hmm. individual. And then as we started to scale, we started to head toward institutional capital where you, know, you need $30 million of equity or something like that for a project. And now our project is scaling to be you know, somewhere between a $30 million equity requirement and a $100 million equity requirement. And those are traditionally institutional sources. I think aspirationally, Alloy wants to be able to keep his assets, lever those assets where we can be the sole equity source and not have institutional yeah. equity partners so that we can have complete freedom. Um, which is not to suggest that institutional capital doesn't give us the freedom or that there's any handcuffs on it. But in difficult times, there's always a negotiation for something that's not been contemplated in a partnership agreement. And when you're in this risk position, you want total control over how to make decisions. As my partner says, when you have a rainy day, I want to be yeah. able to make the decision about what happens on that bad day. And institutional capital creates you know, more complexity in those situations because we're usually on the ones who are on the recourse or on the debt. And um, so I think we'll end up being more like a family office over time where we are the sole investor for our own work. Um, and I shouldn't really say it that way. We are seeking partners that we care about. Um, and in fact, on the last equity raise that we did, we raised um, a big chunk of equity, almost 30% of our equity through a BIPOC with a BIPOC lens to it, where we were trying to create more equity, even through actual investing in cash, um, that our investors could be diverse as well. Um, and so it's, it's not really about total control. It's about freedom and mm. institutional control. Well, um, what, what makes a good investor partner for you? How do you sort of qualify who's going to be suitable and who wouldn't be a good partner? Yeah, it's a, great, it's a great question. I think the um, one of the skills that we've honed over time is that we use our own equity um, to finance usually the acquisition of a, a project and all of the pre-development work. And we're not seeking investors until we're seeking construction financing, okay. which means that we're approaching people with a very clear vision and value set about what we want. Um, and the benefit of that is that 
people will choose to invest in exactly what we're investing in versus us having to in, call it negotiate the value set or the future. Um, and it's where we've used our economic strength to date is to have uh, to ask for investment or uh, equity at mm. the last minute. Um, so good investors share a value set, just most importantly, which is do they care about design? Are they willing to invest in, or I sh a different way to say it is, forego returns for a project that has uh, more of a connection to place or the city or this alternative value set? Because we're usually making... Uh, at 1 John Street, we donated a space to the Brooklyn Children's Museum. At 168 Plymouth Street, we created something called the Better Brooklyn Fund, which would make grants when the project's complete to uh, the local Brooklyn community. And 100 Flatbush, we're you know, talking about we're building two public schools and donating a cultural institution. And so they have to believe in alternative value propositions. Um, and sometimes those are weird, like, and not weird, but... Um, hard for the business community to understand. Like with Flatbush, we're building New York City's first all-electric skyscraper. And that as a business proposition a few years ago was unheard of in a lot of ways. Um, and it's not something I can put down mathematically, but we need to sort of sell a future vision that decarbonization is a value set that will become the most important amenity mm -hmm. for folks. And we need to put ourselves in that position to be able to talk about that um, from a business perspective, but where the investor has essentially no risk for that, where we will assume those risks and they have to make that decision alongside how, us. How, have so. you, or how did you go about building your network of investors and finding those people that have those, the similar sorts of values? And I, I, I imagine that it's, you know, by what you're describing there is that it is, it's quite different from how many developers would be looking at a piece of real estate and you've got this long-term vision which is really about nurturing and cultivating a sense of place in the city um, and it, this is not just a, it's not, a, it's not a pure financial transaction, it's, it's something longer, longer term. Yeah, we're, in one regard, we're bad at it. Um, we, if we primarily identify with the architectural industry um, as a as a cohort, because the my development peer set. Every time I go to a development thing, you know, event of some kind, it's invariable that someone asks, "How much money did you make on that last deal?" <laughs> it's sort of like, Jesus, I don't give a shit, you know. Like, <laughs> sorry, but it's my. It, I'm just not in that same headspace, right? And they're economic beings, and which doesn't mean that they don't care mm -hmm. about work too, but. It, I find that to be the culture so much more than not that we don't affiliate with that group and so I'm often not networking with that group. So um, the truth is, is that we end up having to hire a, a capital markets group advisor when we seek to finance things if it's not through our own network that we're courting you know, 50 people and we're trying to figure out for ourselves, like on the human level, do we trust this individual what does their company care about? What other projects have they financed that you know are analogous to ours? How have they behaved in similar or difficult situations that are unknown? Um, and we just try to interview as best we can. And fortunately or unfortunately, capital relationships are always fleeting because institutional capital certainly always has a mandate affiliated with it, which drives it in different directions over time, right? Um, Ten years ago, or it's about opportunity zone financing and now it's you know about something else and you know our we can never quite hold on to these relationships we make everybody a lot of money and yeah. you're friends with everybody but sometimes their investment advisory group is always like oh we're not doing that now you're not wearing purple and it's a Tuesday <laughs> and we only invest on Tuesdays if you're wearing purple. So I'm sorry it doesn't fit, right? The buckets of capital are so yeah. specific um, that, um, you know, lending relationships are the things that we try to build. But even then, sometimes there's too much concentration in a specific marketplace or, or some other reason um, why we will or will not be successful with a particular relationship we have. But most importantly for us is to be reliable and be clear um, with our partners, so we always have references on how we did, and we offer that to all of our um, folks. As there's not a single partner that anybody Brilliant. can't talk to. Um, you were talking about earlier about the, how the company structure is actually five different companies, and so you have this 
sort of vertical integration that's happening. One of those companies is, you said real estate management, you've got the design company, you've got the development company, um, and then one of them is contractors as well? Uh, there, we have a construction, con construction yeah. company, um, and we have a, okay, a real, so estate real estate brokerage, brokerage company. In construction. So the, just talking about the construction element of this, now this is another hugely risky area to be getting involved in. Um, when, did, when did that part of the yeah. company emerge and, and what was the catalyst for? <laughs> yeah, well, I, you know, I had this dual masters in architecture and construction management. I always kind of knew we would head back there. Um, the truth of the matter is it's the business I like <laughs> the least. Like I, I, and a different way to say it is I hate it, right? I, we're, we're not good at it and I hate it. And the reason we're not good at it and we, and we hate it is because we don't have enough market intelligence to, uh, and enough market access to really build the relationships um, that we need to on the mm -hmm. subcontractor side or the market information or the vendor side to be great at it. And when it, you know, a lot of construction companies can do development um, as their side business, but a development company can't really do construction as its side business is the, the way I like to think about it. So we use ours as more like a green beret force, right? It's, it's, it's really used to solve problems. And the times that we've used it were one, we were building some of the first passive house buildings in New York City and nobody knew how to do it and therefore nobody knew how to price it. And we'd built a couple and so we decided we would just build on our own. It wasn't complicated, um, but it's a lot of bandwidth. And more recently, we used it um, because I had a contractor right. go bankrupt during the pandemic and we had to put in place and kind of solve our own problem. And so it's nice to have the horsepower and the resource. But, you know, instead of having one person to call and having one problem, I suddenly had 60, right? I have 60 different vendors, um, contractors, suppliers, subcontractors, um, et cetera. And, you know, because my partner and I signed the checks, they all need to talk to us. And so it's a huge energy suck you know and emotionally it's yeah. terrible and you're dealing with you know um we're not at a level where we're dealing with the top of the industry mm. and the scale of construction that we will tackle the you know the construction values aren't high enough 20 25 million dollars that subcontractor pool that does five million dollars a year is not the most organized cohort of individuals and so you have to do a lot of work for them. We like to say we have to chew their food, right? You have to give them the presentation of what they have to do, tell them to show up, ask them if they're going to bring their tools. Do you have your pants on? Do you, you know, like, what, you know, whatever it is, you have to like really help them through the situation and be organized for them. And it's just, you know, it's a horrible business. And again, we use it to save ourselves. Brokerage, though, is the best business. That was the net, yeah. <laughs> what's, what's the, what's the, the, yeah. the, the one that you would recommend everybody has? <laughs> well, First of all, nobody can sell the yeah. future like an architect. So if you are the architect for your own spaces, it's very compelling mm -hmm. and very sincere to have my design team be selling condominiums where they say, well, when I designed this kitchen and when we laid out this living room, we located the outlets here, here and here to make sure because this is where we were thinking about this, that or the other thing. And it, it's very intimate and personal. And at the end of the day, we're not making yeah. widgets, we're making homes. And that's very compelling. We also have that team of folks do the punch list for those um, buyers that are buying. And so there's this relationship that forms that has to be very trusting, but is also very difficult for uh, those people. And I'd say the most important part about it is that the buyers don't really know that they're being interviewed in the process. Um, are they a good fit for our building? And then on the other hand, we're also getting market intelligence that's feeding directly into the design team where they're saying, I love this space or I hate this. And then we can take that and mature that and learn from that really accurately for the future to know what the product should be. So there's so many aspects to that business, which are great. The economic side of it is also um, very rewarding, right? The broker is there for the least amount of time. They have the least amount of risk and they're selling it based on the future value <laughs> of the asset. And so... The, the fees are rather extraordinary and yeah. we're candidly there anyway. Um, so um, it's been a great uh, business in so many regards from a market intelligence perspective and from a quality of our product and from what we learn in meeting with people um, that I highly recommend it. It, it, it's, it sounds like a lot of the way that these other parts of Alloy developed was actually you know, a solution to or scratching your own back. 
Yeah. Yeah. I think that's right. I think early on, we obviously couldn't be our own broker and we couldn't be our own yeah. contractor and we couldn't do any of these things. And, but we were really engaged in the process and wanted to learn the business. And then we were sort of like, well, why aren't we doing it? And, um, you know, getting information filtered through an outside party is difficult where someone can say, well, I like Brown and Brown is in right now. And we can say, well, we've met with 228 people, 180 of them liked you know, the bleached oak, not the dark brown. And so we'll have the actual data and we can record that data and really understand it. And, and it is different. And it is this point of control where you're saying it's partially about scratching your own back, which some of which is, again, about risk mitigation. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if the sales team understands something and they're saying, this is not going well, that's risk mitigation for us because we might choose to change a unit. And now we, you know, we did that once in our history um, but you can pick up on things, and all of our businesses are that way. Mm. I mean, um, again, risk mitigation and risk assumption is fundamentally what we do on a daily basis. We just try to make really beautiful versions of, of buildings in our city that function in a handful of, from a handful of different perspectives, and I think it requires that level of participation. What, what does the, the business look like internally in terms of the structure of, of people? and your actual kind of physical location. How many, how many people in the entire group and, and how do you as the leadership team kind of, how have you established what your roles are? Yeah, it's a, it's a good one. We, we have an open studio. It looks like an architecture firm here. It's, there's right. between 15 and 18 of us. We try to keep it small. I like to say that we control time. And so we are always the design architect and the architect of record for our own work. And so sometimes that means that we just need more time to complete um, a project and and so we literally just have to account for that um, but our corporate tree is circular um, there's a key group of principals um, my partners Catherine and and AJ and I and we have a daily call every day at 830 and we've done that for almost 17 years now um, where we talk about what's happening on each project or a new acquisition and we do that literally every single day um, and we rarely miss a day um, and then we have a Another group of folks, which are our senior directors, who each have a different, call it, responsibility of the practice that they look after. We have um, someone who focuses on development, someone who focuses on the entirety of the office management and staff, someone who's the director of architecture, someone who's the director of um, sales, someone who's the director of construction, and, and that team um, works together to identify the resources and each of our employees is kind of like a Swiss army knife and mm. sometimes they're working on brokerage and sometimes they're working on development and sometimes they're working on architecture. The thing that binds us all together is that there's architectural training for almost everybody in the office. Um, so everybody's gone to architecture school. We have, uh, or just about, we have um, eight licensed architects on staff. Um, and so it's call it a top heavy architecture firm where there's a lot of experience uh, amongst the core group of people and then our staff and then people float around based on what phase of the project we're in at any given time. Um, wow, so that's that's a very interesting experience for your, your team to be able to get you know to the cold face if you like of say the brokerage and the sales of what's happening with the with the assets that after they've been been built or even you know whilst they're still on being in construction um, and I guess that that starts to develop a really interesting uh, body of knowledge that you've got as a again another asset for the company yeah I think it's rewarding for the staff because mm. it's you know they're not in Revit the whole time right everybody can jump yeah. into Rhino or AutoCAD or Revit or whatever the case is but usually that's not their job unless that's what they want it to be right mm -hmm. that we have some people who really only want to do one thing and they are the expert and they own that area of expertise. Um, but for the most part, there's a lot of diversity. And, and what we'd like to say is we make buildings, right? We, we don't identify as a developer. We don't identify as an architect or, you know, broker or contractor. We just say we make buildings and it's, it's the most clear representation because <laughs> I, I don't know what else to say that I do for a daily basis. Cause at a cocktail party, if I say I'm a developer, you know, someone may spit on me. And if I, you know, if I say I'm an architect, um, doing development, they don't really understand that. They don't think I'm really taking risk or, or doing something. And if I say I'm a broker, maybe that's even worse than being a developer. <laughs> but, you know, it's, it's, it's just funny, right? There's like, uh, you know, I, I don't know. So we make buildings. Do, does the team, in terms of like the ownership of, the, of Alloy, 
Um, is there any, have you been innovative around that or is it a kind of traditional structure where the leadership team has got the majority shareholders or is it something that the, that the team can buy into and they can get a piece of the, of the assets as well? How, how does that work? Yeah, we are um, in the process of rethinking that. Um, I think historically Alloy was three principles and we thought mm. we'd make 10 or 12 projects together and we'd retire and Alloy would be done. Yeah. Um, but what we've realized is um, Alloy has this other value um, where we are now starting to compete with publicly traded companies on much bigger you know, um, projects and we are perceived as a big development company even though we're not, which means it has a, it has a future and an economic future. Um, and I think we've created a culture in the real estate industry that's unique. And so we um, started putting together a meaningful succession plan um, and started to articulate very clearly the call it different phases of ownership for our employees mm. um, and what that means. And, you know, we're starting um, that process now. And some of that has to do with more traditional compensation, right? Where we have compensation and then discretionary bonuses. And then obviously um, we're starting to consider um, offering appreciation rights in individual projects um, where people will start to own individual pieces of projects and then over time ownership into the company. I think the long-term challenge is is that when you're a principal, there is an extraordinary amount of recourse. And yeah. what we need to do candidly over the next number of years is to make our employees wealthy enough that they can participate in that recourse. Yeah. Um, and that kind of sounds gross, but there's truth to it, which mm. is my personal balance sheet and my partner's personal balance sheet. We sign personal guarantees for extraordinary amounts of money and we're at risk for that. And until somebody's capable of doing that, um, meaning we've you know, all succeeded together in certain regards or from one lens um, until there's a certain amount of, you know, net worth and liquidity, it's hard for them to be in that ownership circle or yeah. we have to start prorating the risk, um, you know, differently or affiliating different sense of ownership. So I think it's going to take time. We are very much focused on that succession plan now and I mm -hmm. think we will succeed. I just turned um, 50 myself and, you know, my partners and I are trying to figure out what that looks like. Um, and, you know, we will transition the ownership of the company entire to others, entirely to others, I think. And over time, the goal is that we will be their investors. Mm. Um, and the future of Alloy will be the three principles that it is as a series of investors for the new, you know, Alloy 2.0. <laughs> um, and hopefully we can create a really clear uh, path to ownership for um, our key folks. Amazing. What advice would you give to other architects who are who have got similar aspirations to become developers? And you know, what would you say would be the biggest challenges that they need to think about? And you know, how could they surmount them, if you like? Yeah, I, I mean. Um I wouldn't hesitate to, smart, to start small. Mm. Um, you know, buying a house for yourself, buying an empty lot, buying a second home, buying a three-family house, all of those things are completely achievable and people have to understand enough about real estate and actually go through an acquisition on their own to really understand it. And, you know, we've helped some of our employees buy their first homes and, and candidly, um, you know, make a lot more money that they can make working here to a degree because um, you know, they create additional and extraordinary value by going home every night and, and assembling a kitchen and you know painting and tiling and all of those things and that's a really valuable learning lesson and once you do a few of those um, you can start scaling up into something that's a little bit more but be patient um, and it does take time and continue to build stepping stones a lot of people come to me and say, I have a, you know, a really wealthy you know, client of mine who's willing to put up equity and we want to buy a project together. And I get that inquiry all of the time. How do you set up your structure? How do you do all these things? And I say, look, um, access to capital is not actually the problem. It's who's willing to sign the loan is the problem. And finding someone who's willing to both put up the capital and sign that loan is where you know, the most difficult part of development is or becoming a developer is. 
um, because often people don't have access to that. And so, you know, what I did early on was say, I won't take anything for it. Um, for I won't take any fees. I won't take anything over the entire course of the project. Mm -hmm. And I know I don't have the net worth and liquidity, but I'll put everything that I have on the line with you. And so it will be meaningful. And I will sign on the, the line um, for recourse. And I won't take any money in the interim. If all works out, it'll be great. And if it doesn't, it doesn't. Um, but I can't offer more than, you know, giving, you know, everything that I've got, right? Yeah. My time, my capacity and all of those things. And I'm I'm foregoing other opportunities to do this one. And that always created this alignment where people could trust me. Um, and that's what got me over the line. But that was hard. Mm. And that took a long time. And I will say business partnerships are incredibly difficult. So don't do it as a matter of convenience or because you happen to know someone. If your instinct is that that person is an asshole, then they're an asshole and you don't want to be in business with them. You know what I mean? Like there's a, there's a degree to which um, you have to trust your instinct because development is solving a series of unimaginable problems, right? Mm. I mean, it's not like nobody ever comes to me and said that thing that was supposed to happen today showed up early and finished and it was less than I thought it was going to be <laughs> like, that's never happened once. So, um, there's always a problem to solve and you have to have a degree of endurance and you want to be with someone who you really, 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 really trust. Mm. And that has been the strength of my partnership, um, in alloy and my partners, AJ and Catherine is, has been a, a true and sincere amount of trust, uh, amongst us. And, we're clearly developing that with our leadership team, which is going to make it much easier to transition because how, how, you really need to know how it goes. How, how did you, uh, Catherine and AG, how, how did you guys come together in the first place? Yeah, so um, as you mentioned earlier, I was converting a building for another developer that Catherine was living in. Um, and she was considering, you know, buying a white box version of the penthouse and having, I was the architect, so the, the developer introduced me to her. And she decided that she wasn't going to buy that, but she interviewed me to, um, to build her this penthouse. And she said, you know what, I'm not going to move ahead with that project, but I'm, I have this great piece of land in Connecticut. And would you design a house for me? I really like meeting. And so we started designing a house for her. And about halfway through that, she said, you know, I'm going to be homeless. If you really, I know you're interested in real estate. If you see a great opportunity, you know, please share it with me and you know i'll invest and so i waited and i took her very seriously and mm -hmm. and um that was another key to our success and i always tell people this which is don't go to the money first when you have a business idea go to everybody who you think is not going to invest first and have them ask all the difficult questions and then go <laughs> to the most likely person last once you're the most prepared um but so catherine you know I took her very seriously and I showed up with an opportunity and literally on a handshake, she wired me a million dollars. We put down a deposit on this property near the High Line and we, and we started a company and she started as a, an investor and about halfway through that project, she said, I really like doing business with you. I don't want to be an investor. Why don't we start a true company together? Mm -hmm. And at around that same time, Alloy, I mean, a AJ and I were introduced through a friend of ours and uh, the architecture company had hired AJ because he knew we were interested in development and, you know, finding an architect developer wasn't really a thing at the time. And AJ and I really appreciated the conversations we had, et cetera. So we, we hired him. And then immediately when we started Alloy, we just all became partners together. And so there was this really wonderful synergy of timing where Catherine and AJ and I all came together kind of at the same time. Catherine was a, a you know, she's a, a true uh, believer mm. in people and she trusted us an extraordinary amount and and me in starting the business and and in putting that deposit down and and here we are you know what, what's, 16 17 years later what's her background she's she's not an architect then she's not an architect she um she has a uh telecommunications call it service right. company she provides um fiber optic copper um, hammers and ladders and things like that to the what was called the regional bell operating companies at the time mm -hmm. and um, you know she has a full-time job as as um, CEO or chair of that business and and she commits to our business as well she's she's uh, has an extraordinary amount of endurance to be running two companies amazing incredible yeah real wide-ranging level of expertise that you're you're bringing in from the from the top yeah. there that can percolate down 
it gave us the privilege to say no to a lot of opportunities really early on where we, AJ and I were sourcing opportunities, finding opportunities and managing those opportunities. And then we used her company's corporate infrastructure mm. to run our back of house. So we had in-house legal and HR and accounting and all of those things. And so it kept us very lean and focused here um, on sourcing opportunities. And there was a lot of synergies between you know, how we were running the company and our ability to call it, not think about running the company in, in certain regards, right? Not, yeah. run, not having an HR department or some of those other things. Over time, we created our own platform for all of those things as, as we needed um, independence for a handful of reasons. But um, it was really the privilege, and, and I, I definitely credit Catherine with her basically saying, look, we don't need to do work. When it's the right opportunity, we should do it but we should never do work to kind of feed the machine to mm -hmm. collect fees. I'd rather do nothing and um, invest in our human capital here by continuing to pay their salaries and wages and our overhead and all of those things and wait for exactly the right opportunity than to um, do something that we shouldn't do. That's a, um, that, that's a very wise sort of business perspective and, and quite a difficult one for, for, yeah. for many, for me, certainly many architects running their own practices not to kind of jump in to do something can feel the pressure to keep feeding the beast if you like yeah it's terrible and i always tell people you're much better off not taking on a commission that isn't perfect for you and investing in yourself which is what i did mm. which is i never did work for free i always tell people don't ever do sketches don't do designs don't do anything for free because the chances of you getting hired are fairly limited and you're giving away the most valuable part of your um, services, which is your initial ideas and how you might approach a problem. And then maybe you get hired, maybe you don't. So I always chose to invest in myself, which is why it, it took me so long to start a business. And I didn't go to school for, you know, uh, real estate and I, I didn't have the experience. But I always said, if I can teach myself this thing, it's much more likely that I will be successful than if I am and I take a risk on somebody else. Because of course, you trust yourself, yeah. or I, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Has there ever been um, projects where you've been involved in from the early stages? Perhaps you've found a site, you guys have done some preliminary research into it, but then you haven't gone ahead with the acquisition, but then you've kind of packaged that research and the site up and have kind of either sold it on or you've created a service where you've made it available to another developer. Does that kind of activities happen, those kind of... Yeah, it's, 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 um, it kind of comes with the territory where we'll spend an extraordinary amount of money and due diligence and time and something won't be successful. Um, we haven't packaged something up for another developer yet, but we've certainly walked away. Right. Um, you know, you, you do a lot of work and it takes a lot of time to get through transactional documents. And sometimes those, you know, getting to a contract can cost millions of dollars sometimes. And on top of that, you have to do environmental due diligence or whatever other due diligence has to be required, and that all takes a real investment of capital. And um, it's uh, it's costly, and so you have to um, head with caution into those situations and know with a degree of certainty that you're going to come out on the other side. But you also can't get wedded to it and committed to it in your mind if it's not the right decision. Yeah. So. Again, I think that's one of the reasons for the 830 calls is that we can all talk about it um, on a daily basis and check ourselves because, you know, after 17 years of phone calls, you can tell when somebody's uncomfortable, mm -hmm. especially, you know, we've been doing video calls for you know, 10 years um, with the group of us, but we, you know, you can really tell when somebody's uncomfortable and there's no reason to do it if somebody's uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. What, what are the sorts of things that are red flags for you for, for you to say no to a project or that would have you hit the eject button? Yeah, I mean, it happens all the time. Um, the factors are always existential. It's always outside of our control. And sometimes it's a market condition or sometimes it's we don't trust who the capital has to be or sometimes we don't trust that we can raise the capital at a particular moment in time. And, and yeah. It's, you know, on one hand, it was governmental, um, where we had gotten actually everything under control, and then um, it was a, essentially threatened to be acquired by the federal government um, for a CSO tank. And um, so some of those things are, you know, again, mostly, mostly existential. But, um, yeah. 
Good, great. What's what's got what's the rest of 2022 got planned for Alloy? <laughs> well, um, I'm focused on the short term, which is maybe this weekend we have 220 concrete trucks coming at one time for a 24-hour pour <laughs> for our 100 Flatbush uh, project, which gives you some insight into my mind space, which is I'm really focused on executing the construction um, of 100 Flatbush right now, which has got you know, 20 something months left, 26, 28 months left and, and, and building two public schools. Um, and, you know, if the perfect acquisition comes up in that time, um, we have time for it and we can accommodate it, but I'm also happy to just be focused on guaranteeing success with, with, with what has been our biggest risk to date, um, which is Flatbush. And I think it will transition us to this rental um, scenario we've been talking about, but it'll also fundamentally change the nature of our company because for the first time we'll have recurring um, cash flow, wow. and um, that'll that'll be a meaningful goal for us over the next few years. And we need to do it flawlessly. Um, so yeah, my mind space is very focused on how are we doing on construction. Amazing, Jared. Well, I think that's the perfect place for us to conclude the conversation there. Thank you so much for giving us that kind of whirlwind tour inside of alloy and the processes and mechanisms that are at play with your um, development of your of your assets and how you deliver incredible place making and and work to to brooklyn it's been absolutely fascinating so thank you very much thank you very much for making time for me today i appreciate it My pleasure it's fun thank you and that's a wrap. And don't forget, if you want to access your free training to learn how to structure your firm or practice for freedom, fulfillment and profit, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you'd like to speak to one of our advisors directly, follow the link in the information. If you enjoyed today's show, please head on over to iTunes and leave us a review. I read every single one. Also, I'd love to get your feedback on this particular episode or the show in general, as well as your recommendations. You can reach us by emailing podcast at businessofarchitecture.com. This podcast is brought to you by Business of Architecture, a leading architect business consultancy. Access our free training on how to structure your architecture firm for more freedom, fulfillment, and financial success by going to smartpracticemethod.com. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, warranty, pledge, contract, bond, or commitment, except to help you conquer the world. Carpe diem.